Welcome to a new sh Young and Naive episode. Uh, I got a new guest. Who are you? This is Senator Bernie Sanders from the state of Vermont. What are you doing in Germany? Welcome. Uh, I wrote a book. It's called in English, It's Okay to be Angry About Capitalism. Uh, we were in Holland uh, for a few days talking about it. We went to Brussels for a day, and we've been in Berlin for a couple of days as well. So, I mean, you're on a show called Young and Naive. This kind of sounds, if you read the book, if you... Uh, um, read what else you have to say about other issues, you seem kind of naive. Like you hope for peace in the Middle East, you hope for overcoming capitalism. Are you naive? You, you think politician? fighting for justice is naive? Apparently, because you haven't been well, successful but in the, decades. Well, well, I think the alternative is cynicism. And cynicism is in fact a very destructive thing, I think, for human beings. It's not a way to live. If you don't have hope for the future, no matter what the obstacles may be, no matter what the successes you may or may not have, uh, I think it's a very sad way to live, frankly. But one could say, like, cynicism works for the West. Cynicism no, works doesn't, for, doesn't for, work for America. Anybody. No, it doesn't work for anybody. Uh, I mean, cynicism is a way of life. Who are you fooling? Uh, it, it's, uh, so I don't agree that cynicism works for anybody. What you have in the world right now, in my view, is a situation, and we don't talk about it enough, uh, there is a massive amount of class warfare taking place, and that's not talked about. You know, we talk about racial issues, we talk about gender issues, uh, we talk about many things, but we don't talk about the fact that the status quo, and it's not cynicism, the people on top have never ever done better, probably in the history of the world. I'm just one example, I don't mean to throw out a whole lot of statistics. But at a time when people all over the world, in the worst cases, are literally starving, fighting to put a few pieces of bread on the table. In my country, uh, a middle class is declining. People are seeing their wages uh, not keep up with inflation. In the midst of all of that, in the last three years since COVID, two-thirds of all of the new wealth created, and that was $42 trillion, went to the top 1%. Two-thirds went to 1%. That is an astounding and disgraceful uh, set of circumstances. But the people have voted for these policies. No, they haven't. Of course, they have not voted for them. They voted for Biden, for Trump. Well, they may Biden. vote for government leaders in Germany and the United States, but in, they did not vote for these policies, and that's the point. You know, I always get a kick out of um, the people say, Joe Biden is the president of the United States. He is the most powerful person on earth, right? You've heard that expression? Yeah. President is, it's not true. Of course, it's not true. Biden has a lot of power. They may control the military. You want to go to war. The president does that. A lot of power. But the most powerful people on earth are people who will determine what workers in Germany and America are making, whether factories stay in this country uh, or not. Uh, people who control the economy are really powerful, and that's the big money interests. Are you able to imagine a United States that is non Capitalistic. No, it's not going to happen in my lifetime, but <laughs> it's – no, you don't bring about the changes, sweeping changes. But I want to give you some examples before we get too deep into cynicism. And I don't want you to become cynical. No, don't I become wanna, cynical. I wanna, uh, this is a hopeful show. All right, this good. This is a show for hopefulness. All right, so here's hope. All right, All let's, right. let's look at things. When I was a kid a few years ago, because as you know, I'm 29 years of age, so it was 10, 15 years ago, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, when I was a young man in America growing up, the southern part of our country had a system of what I would call apartheid, okay? That's what it was. You, you know that. Mm -hmm. And that means schools were segregated by race. Black people couldn't go to a movie theater. Black people couldn't vote in the United States of America in the 1950s, all right? That is... If I talk to young people about that in America, they don't even believe it. They say, don't be ridiculous. What, what are you talking about? Give you another example. Change. It took place in a relatively, not fast enough, short period of history. Since then, we've had a black president win re-election, okay? When I was a kid, or even your age, and somebody said to me, do you think in your lifetime you will have a black president in the United States? I'd say, no. There's no way it could happen. We're too racist to the country. Mm -hmm. Obama won, and he got re-elected. That's hope, all right? Give you another example. I've been in the United States Senate now for three six-year terms. I'm completing my third term, 17 years. 
early on in my term, there were 100 people in the U.S. Senate. Do you know how many women there were in the Senate? A few. One. At one point. Well. At one point, there was one woman, 99 men. Now, I don't know what it is. It's 20, 25. And the number's going to grow every day. Uh, years ago, in my own state, we elected a woman governor. It was a big deal. Today, the women governors all over the country. When I was a kid growing up, uh, went to a very large high school, I did not know one kid who identified as being gay. Not one. Okay. Were there gay kids? Of course they were. But that wasn't the moment. You couldn't express your sexuality. All of that has changed radically. But, but these in are the United cultural. States. But these are cultural yes, changes. Yes, they are cultural but, but, issues. But you talk about economic You are. You know, let issues. me finish my sentence because right. your point is right. That's right. These are all social cultural issues mm -hmm. that have gone radically transformed. Good news. Bad news is that in terms of economics, if anything, situation is worse. And the fight for economic democracy and for economic change is a lot harder fight than for women's rights or gay rights. Like what, what, why can the U.S. outlaw slavery? Like they can outlaw racial segregation, but why can't they outlaw being a billionaire? They could. We do it tomorrow. How? I could introduce the legislation, and if I had the votes to pass it, we could do it. How do you do that? You introduce a piece of legislation. There But your there question can, there is— cannot be— uh, Yeah, you can have a tax a code. Wealth. Sure. Okay. You can introduce a wealth tax or a tax okay. code that says, you know, after you make uh, $999 million, the tax will be 99%. Well, right? You could do it. I could do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Would it pass? No. We got about two votes in the Senate. So we could do it, but we don't have the political support— To do that, but more importantly than just abolishing billionaires, what is much harder is how, in fact, given the world today with all of the technology that we have out there, how do you create an, not only an economy that works for all, okay, but an economy where people enjoy going to work, feel productive, uh, and take satisfaction in what they do? How do we create that? That ain't so easy. And we need to be thinking about that. But all of these things are doable if there is a political will and if we have the courage to take on billionaires who would rather not do anything like that. I mean, what you talk about basically is abolishing capitalism because capitalism doesn't work for all, all people. It cannot inherently. So The system and, – and I would define this – look, there's capitalism and there's capitalism. You're a capitalist, right? You started a, a, a podcast and you earn a living on it and you have a lot of support. Yeah, is that capitalism? Sure. So what? You're sure. a small business person. You got a lot of people out there started their own little companies, right? They started their shops, right? They work very hard. They make a living. Yes. Is that capitalism? So what? Do we think with the state, the government should own? It's like a market economy. Maybe, yeah, maybe but, not capitalism. All right. But in other words, should the government own every what we call mom and pop store, small business? Should we own your podcast? No, of course we should not. No. All right. On the other hand, should the government deal with the fact that in America— You have three people who own more wealth than the bottom half of American society. Absolutely, we should. Should the government deal with the fact that in industry after industry, sector after sector, whether it's Wall Street, media, agriculture, transportation, a few very, very, very large multi-billion dollar corporations control those sectors? Yes, we should. But I mean like – Taxing these uh, super rich is one thing, but like they, they would still own almost everything. Like how do you change ownership, like the change of the means of production, as Good. Karl Marx okay. would say? All right. Well, now, in America, and I think, I think I, I mean, you'll figure me, I just don't know much about the European, European or German economy. Uh, in America, what has happened over the last many years under both Republican and Democratic administrations is there has been very little what we call antitrust. I don't know if that phrase means anything here. It means in America, you're supposed to have a competitive capitalist system. And, you know, if I become so big that I could dominate the market, I could put you out of business, then it's not a competitive society. Mm -hmm. And increasingly in America, it is not. So for a very long time, both Democratic and Republican administrations have done nothing in trying to break up these very, very large corporations. We are seeing now actually some movement in the Biden administration to do that. But it is it is a hard road to travel and we've got to deal with the conservative courts and so forth. But breaking up these very, very large corporations and beginning to think about worker ownership uh, and collective ownership 
of 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 uh, businesses is, I think, a direction that we but, want to pursue. But Bernie, how do you how do you organize these takeovers? Well, you organize. Uh, look, I don't have all the magical answers. It's not a question of you don't. I, I don't. Too I'm bad. sorry. I was hoping that you did, but uh. I don't. Uh, I mean, I think that's part of a political movement. We're just talking to people who are building a movement for uh, to take on uh, climate change. That's a movement. Uh, but what we need, and what we are seeing in America, by the way, which is also very good news to the cynics out there, is we're seeing a very significant growth in the trade union movement in America. More and more workers want to be part of unions. Unions are now looked upon much more positively today than they were uh, decades ago. Uh, and we're seeing some major strikes where workers are making the right demands. I don't know if you know the quote, uh, Frederick Jameson, the quote of him is, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Hmm. Is that true for you? Probably no, Not for me, but... Look, I mean, one can easily uh, imagine the end of the world. Is there going to be a nuclear war? Uh, will we not get a handle on climate? Doesn't uh, look like it. Will there be a terrible pandemic that could be worse than COVID? Is that possible? Yeah, all those things are possible. You want to imagine them? Yeah, you could look. You can imagine the end of the world. I think there are many people who, I think from religious terms, what do they call it, end times? Mm -hmm. Is that the phrase they use? Mm -hmm. I think this is the end of the world. Everything is falling apart. But it, it, you can imagine that. But isn't that a problem that we can, it's easier to... Uh, Imagine the end of the world through many examples than to uh, than to imagine changing the very fabric of our economy. Is that a problem? It is a huge problem. And that is, it is a problem. And that is what the system does. The worst thing about the system is not only the greed and the inequality. It is in a thousand different ways. It's not that there's some person up there sitting there who does these things, okay? It's a thousand different forces. It takes place every time you turn on the TV every newspaper you read, every politician you hear from. The bottom line is, you think you can change the world? Hey, you can't. Nothing you can do. I got the power. You have nothing. Mm -hmm. So go knock your head against the wall. That's fine. You're not going to change the world. And that is the message that gets out there, that we are hopeless. We're small people, and we can't take on the powers that be. And how you fight against that in your own mind and politically Uh, that is one of the great challenges we face. I just listened to like an NPR podcast the other day. You know NPR? Yes, I do know NPR. Like there, there was there was a sentence from the host that said, like she said, capitalism is a conspiracy theory. Do you agree? Conspiracy theory? Yeah. That, that it that, works for everyone, that, that this, it's the best system. Oh, in that sense, that it's the only system, sure. Yeah. I, 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 it, the idea that we can't imagine any alternative to that uh, is exactly what the system wants us to believe. But in truth, it is not easy. You know, you live in a highly complicated world with all kinds of technology. How do you create a humane society? How do you empower ordinary people who have economic and political control over their lives? Not easy stuff. Eat the rich. No, it's harder than that. I'm I mean, that's a kidding. start. But... <laughs> But, uh, you know, so that is, those are the issues. But again, we have got to be mobilizing people in that direction to make it clear that the people who own the world are not nice people and they are not concerned about ordinary people. They are very, very greedy. And in terms of climate, if they end up destroying the planet to make money, that's the way it is. How did you get to be such a, politician who cares about justice and equality where, where did that come from like where what kick-started your political activism so what kick-started your political act i mean you know we the all Iraq war i was at a high school in texas actually that's true you're in, and what and you were in i went to the high school yeah uh, like an exchange year yeah i was in texas yeah 2002 2003 and the Iraq war started And people, like my, my fellow students, they made me uh, explain the German position on no to the Iraq war. Huh. That's how it kick-started. Good. Very good. What about you? I think it, uh, for me, uh, it started, uh, I think, younger. Uh, e I, even younger? Uh. Yeah. No, it, um, for me, it started growing up in a family that did not have money. And what I recognized as a very young child is the stress and the disputes between my parents over the lack of money. So it was a constant source of uh, tension in our house. 
And I saw the difference between families that had money, what they could do, and families that did not have money, including my own. So that was an important fact. And the other important fact in terms of justice is I am Jewish and can remember very, very well the uh, late 40s and learning about what the Holocaust was about. Uh, and learning what racism uh, was about. And it impacted my own family. My father came from Poland, and uh, I think his entire family was wiped out uh, uh, during that period. Is it true that you lived in a kibbutz in Israel? It is. I did in the uh, 60s. Where Not was for that? a short period of time. Where was that? I can't, I'm often asked that. I can't, I've lived in the two kibbutzim for uh, maybe a couple, of, a couple of months. Why did you do that? Well, because kibbutzim are very, and God, you know, we're talking about it right now at a moment where one of the kibbutzim uh, mm-hmm. near the Palestinian border was, you know, almost wiped out completely by, uh, uh, you know, Hamas. Um, because it was a way of living that interested me back then. And what it was was common ownership of the production. Uh, they were agricultural uh, communities. So they grew products. People made decisions collectively. They would have large meetings and decide doing this. They elected their leadership. Mm. You know, it wasn't like somebody top down. Their profits were uh, equally divided. So the idea of collective decision and, and what you could see, what I learned then, and you know, is people did feel that empowered is the wrong word, but they were different. You know, when you are a worker, for, say, for a large company and you have no power, you develop a certain mentality. I'm going to work this morning because I need a paycheck, right? I have no power on the job. My boss will tell me what to do. I'll probably try to do as little as I can, but that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the case there. So there was a different attitude toward work because you owned it. You're a bought owner of it. You made the decisions. I like that. And I also remember distinctly that seeing older people uh, being much more active uh, and live than I had seen in the United States. I, I haven't forgotten that. It was just they were part of a community, and there were community activities. You know, in the evening, people would get together and do this and that. So it's a way of life, not for everybody, to be sure. And in fact, in Israel, the, you know, the kibbutzim movement originally, way back when, was a very important part of their economy. It's gone mm. down significantly. Uh, but it's a way of life that interested me. Did that change your life? I wouldn't say it changed it, but it reinforced my belief Uh, that democracy, and that is kind of a democratic institution. So we talk about democracy. Mm -hmm. What do we mean? You have the right to vote, what, Germany have elections, what, every five years? Four years. Four years, okay. So America, we have four years for president, two years for Congress. Is that all there is? Is that the only right you have? That's what some people say. Yeah, well, that's it. But we talk about economic democracy, which is would be transformative to say that in the case of the kibbutz, people would sit around the room and argue, no, we shouldn't do this decision, no. This guy should not be elected the leader. That guy should be. I, you know, and they vote. And I think that makes you more human. Makes you more mentally alert. You have power. Did you, Did you run for yeah. office in the kibbutz? No, of course not. <laughs> I was there picking some great foods. What so did you do actually? I think I picked great foods. Was what I did. Did you become uh, like? Did you get in contact with Palestinians back then? No, 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 no. No, I was very, very young, and all I did was I don't want to overstate it. Many people, uh, I'm sure, many Germans as well. In fact, my brother met his wife, who was English, on a kibbutz. So it was not unusual in those point, at that point for people from all over the world to come to kibbutz to work and help out. That's all I did. Is the uh, current war in the Middle East like a personal issue to you? No, it's not just personal. It is personal, but it's not just personal. But also personal. It's, it's a horror show. There's nothing... You know, you talk about, we talk about, we think about uh, human destructiveness and all the horrible tendencies of human beings, and you're seeing it playing out as we speak right now. So you're seeing Hamas, which is a terrorist organization, uh, figuring out a way to break through into Israel, and then some guys with machine guns are shooting down young kids who are dancing, uh, killing women and children. Uh, and doing terrible things. The the death toll in Israel is going to be very, very high. You know, they compare it to 9-11 in the United States where we lost 3,000 innocent people out of over 300 million. Uh, Israel proportionally will lose a lot more as a result of this. And then you're going to see Israel's response where against uh, Gaza where you have 2 million people who already, before this whole business, living in total despair. Do you know what the unemployment rate before 
this disaster. You know, seventy percent, seventy over seventy percent for young people. For yeah. young people, so you live in a you live in a place where water is intermittent, electricity is intermittent. Seventy percent of the young people are unemployed. Total disaster, and people all over the world. I know in Germany, in the United States, in Israel. You know, very one. I met with these people, young, brave people, in my office. More than a few times, we would have young Israelis and Palestinians come together and talk in my office, talk about, you know, how we can work together to ease the pain of the occupation. All that is gone now because what that terrorist attack has done, it is emboldened the right wing, Netanyahu, and those even to his right who now say, see, we told you, you can never trust the Palestinians. And for was, the, he, was he right, Netanyahu? No, he was not right. But oh. what you then have on, it, this is the problem, what you have then on the Hamas side is people say, you see, you, you told us we can never have any military victory. We went in there and we killed a thousand people. Our, this is not wonderful. We can do it. Let's keep it. We put all these missiles in the air. We can do it. Rockets in the air. So it emboldens the extremes on both sides to create a never-ending cycle of hatred uh, and destruction. It is an awful thing. And it has set back, uh, you know, justice for the Palestinians uh, as well as the peace process for how long, I don't know, but a long time. Like you you uh, once, at least once said that Israel has the absolute right to live in peace and security, but so do the Palestinians. Yes. You also say Palestinians' lives matter. Yep, it's true. Why do you care about Palestinians? You're What kind of question is that? Why do you do this program? Why do you care about the things you care about? Because you're a human being. I want, yeah, I want, I want to know why you care about it. Well, I want to know why you care. No, like the the many Western governments, the United States government, they support Israel now. Like well, uh, Gaza is about to be bombed to the Stone Age, maybe. Yeah. Why why do you care? Well, in I, this situation, after Hamas did this. Well, it's not a question. All the quotes that you gave me go from way back because Palestinians are human beings. Last I heard, they're human beings. Israelis are human beings. And the goal is to bring about a situation where people can live in peace and the Palestinians can get uh, justice. So it's not just Palestinians I care about. I care about the people in southern Africa now who are facing uh, starvation because of climate change. I think as human beings, we have got to care about uh, other human beings. What do you think of your government, of the Biden government, supplying Israel with weapons, aircraft well, carriers? We'll see, I don't, uh, look, it's a very difficult situation, and I've been here since all of that has broken out, so I've got to learn more about it. Have you talked to Biden yet about it? In this last week? No. No, I haven't. Would he, would he listen to you? Uh, well, we talk occasionally, yeah. But we, I've been here since this whole thing broke out. I mean, you're on the show called Young and Eve. We talked about hope. How can you... Bring Israelis and Palestinians together after this. Well, that's my point. It has made the situation, which was very bad before, even worse. But it's not a question. You don't give so, up. Where, where's the way out? Well, look, you know, I can't, I don't give you magic lances. You know, we went through, as Germany is more than familiar with, a world war. At the end of the world, this country was in rubble. rubble all right? A few years later, you were able to, with the help of the United States, rebuild and create a democratic form of society. All right, things change. But all I would say is what Hamas did was a disaster, and it is certainly going to set back the process a very long time. But how do, you, how do we avoid another disaster and another disaster? Well, look, I don't know the answers. The answer is that we continue to work for peace uh, and not for uh, wars and destruction. Why does your government take sides? I mean, Pardon it's me? the most powerful government in the world. They could bring both sides together. I mean, the United States won a two-state solution. The European well, you know, Union wants the, a two-state you know, solution. The United States, the whole world wants a two-state okay, solution. Okay, look, I mean, I believe me, I understand that I'm involved in that. Uh, and some of us are doing the best that we can. And, you know, there have been efforts to appease Jimmy Carter. There was some, you know, two-state solution. But it's not just... America does not run Israel, and, uh, you know... But you they, have, they have the most influence from, from the outside. They have influence, but the last I heard, Americans don't vote in Israeli elections, and the people of Israel voted for Mr. Netanyahu. That's true. I mean, this is not your first historical struggle. I mean, you've been uh, a politician and activist for many, many dec decades now. What kind of mistakes do we need to avoid? I mean, you mentioned 9-11. We know about all the Vietnam War, other wars... Uh, other catastrophes, like human beings made a lot of mistakes. 
when they were grieving, when they were angry, when they were in crisis. Are there like mistakes when it comes to the Middle East now that we n desperately need to avoid? Well, I think what we have to appreciate is that in Gaza, Gaza is, as I mentioned, I think earlier, uh, a, an incredibly impoverished uh, settlement, ter territory, whatever it's called, where you have two million people, 70% unemployment for the young people, intermittent electricity, health care, whatever. Uh, and I, it would be a terrible thing if the innocent uh, women and children of Gaza, and half of Gaza, as I understand that, are children, uh, were punished uh, because of the actions of the, the uh, Hamas terrorist group. So, all right, and... Uh, what, what is... Yeah. Like, one, one last topic. Your integrity, like, on both sides of the aisle in, in Washington, people, like, would always say, you're the guy with integrity. Some would say that. Many would not. Some. Why is that so important to you? Like, why, why have you... Look, asking me, the, the, quite, I don't look at the world that way. It, it, I didn't say it was important to no, me. No, you're, you're the exception to the rule, so apparently. I, oh, well, well, you say apparently, I don't know. But I do what I do. You do what you do. All right, we all do what we do. To me... But why do you do that? Because I think it's the right thing to do. Why do you do what you do? I mean, you know, we do what we do because we think it's the right thing to do. I am lucky enough to have been voted into the United States Senate by the people of the state of Vermont. And I'm very proud of that and appreciative of that. And I have a job to do. You have a job to do, right? You do podcasts, right? You interview people. You try to do them as well as you can. Well, I'm a United States senator. So my job is to do my job as well as it is. And it encompasses many, many issues. And I have a political philosophy and ideology, which I try to implement, along with the people of my state and the country. That's what I do. What? Have you ever like wrote written down your principles and uh, like put them on the wall and be like, okay, I'm never gonna. Yeah, well, I wrote a book. It's in front of you. I know. But why? Why do you like? It's, even in Germany, like there are no politicians like you who have who seem to have principles. So, like uh, when in doubt, like uh, or when they think something is wrong, they vote against their own coalition, uh, their own party. Well, I, like, I the, thank the, you. The, I look. I mean, I, I thank you like, for the nice words uh, and. Um, Flattery will get you everywhere, but uh, it's not flattery. Like it's a fact. No, like uh, uh, politi politics, as you said, is like seems to be about every cynicism. country has its own systems and its own people, and they do what they do. So I, I, I really, honestly, would not comment on German politics. I don't know anything about it. Uh, all I can tell you is that uh, from an early age, uh, people, many people don't know this. The first, I, you know, as you know, in the United States, we have a two part, basically a two party system: Democrats and Republicans. Uh, when I first ran for office, I ran on a third party, a very small third party. And you know what? How many votes I got? I got two percent of the vote. And then I ran again. And you know what I got? One percent of the vote. And then I ran again. I got four percent. Then I got six percent. Then I stopped running. <laughs> And then eventually I got elected mayor of Burlington by 10 votes and mm -hmm. got reelected a number of times. I haven't lost much since then. But, um, you know, it's uh, the reason I ran outside of the two-party system is I looked at the world differently then. And I remain the longest serving independent in American history because they still look at the world a little bit differently. Like, in the end, did you ever have a plan B for your life? Like, uh, what if you didn't become mayor of Burlington? Like, what if nobody cared about your ambitions? Yeah. Like, what what would, it, would would you have done? I would have been competing with you for a uh, podcast. I, I read about that. You, you wanted to be a journalist. Oh, you I was were a journalist, journalist for a while. And what I did do, which was a lot of fun, one of the things that struck me uh, in America, and I suspect it's, it's true all over the world, but in the United States, we don't do well with history. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of interesting people and events very few people know anything about. So what I did in the 1970s before I was elected, I started a small nonprofit group to do videos. That was kind of, by the way, the early- Videos? Videos. Wow. Uh, documentaries, mm -hmm. kind of primitive, not you know, not very sophisticated at all. I did one on the life of Eugene Debs. Do you know who Eugene Debs is? No. Ah, my point. <laughs> Nobody in America knows who Eugene Debs is, but he was a very great man. Debs, uh, was in the late 1800s and early 1900s. He was a leader of a large trade union movement. 
Uh, he ran for president five times on the Socialist Party ticket, including once when he was in jail because of his opposition to World War I. He was a wonderful human being, really a wonderful political leader. Nobody in America knew who he was. So, you know, I did a video on him. Uh, and I would have, if I hadn't gone into politics and gotten elected, that's probably what I've done. Try to take a look at American history and see how we could educate people about aspects of our history that they don't know about. Did, do you have any, did you, back then, did you have any conviction about politics, sure. about uh, society that you don't have now? Well, you know, I'm a little bit older and I have seen things, you know, and... Uh, Can you give me an example? Well, you know, when you, uh, you know, are a United States senator, it's very different than when you are somebody protesting the war in Vietnam out on the streets or protesting uh, against racism in America. You, you know, your, your worldview changes by definition with age and the position that you are are in. So I am a different person than I was, uh, you know, 40 years ago. Bernie, thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Uh, come back anytime. And don't become too cynical. No, that's not, that's not my plan. All right. This, this show is called Young and Naive. Like we, we're, All here, right. we're here for well, We don't want naivety too. We want young and effective. That's well, what we like. na being naive can mean being hopeful. Yes, it can. Ca it can mean overcoming Capitalism. It can mean uh, getting peace there in the Middle East. Let's do it. Thanks so much, and uh, thanks so much for watching. This is a, a program financed through small donations, just like your presidential campaign. Which is fantastic. Absolutely. Corporate control of the media, a major issue. You're breaking through that. Congratulations. Let's keep doing Thank that. You, Thank viewers. you so much. All right. Bye. Can you... Can you